Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On December 14, 1947, the Cleveland Browns, led by legendary Otto Graham, defeated the New York Yankees for a second year in a row for the AAFC Championship. In this same year, a future division rival of the Browns made it to their first ever NFL playoffs. This team resides in the Steel City, and this week's guest wrote a book dedicated entirely to the 1947 Steeler team called Starless. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time we step up the DeLorean. The date is July 8th, 1933. We're sitting in Mr. Art Rooney's hip pocket because we're here to witness the founding of one of the NFL's most revered teams, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, getting a new franchise was great for the city. However, they did suffer through about 40 years of basically abysmal seasons. There was one playoff appearance in the middle of that 40 years, the magical season of 1947. Even though they did not have a victory, they at least made the playoffs. And this week's guest, Steve Massey, wrote an entire book on the, well, we'll call it at the time, magical year for the Pittsburgh Steelers. This book is titled Starless, the 1947 Pittsburgh Steelers. You can pick up your copy today with an Amazon link in the show notes, or maybe you get a chance to win a copy, an autographed copy of the book from Steve Massey himself. To sign up for the copy of the book or to purchase it directly through our Amazon link, maybe learn a little bit more about Steve Massey, catch Steve on another podcast in the Sports History Network, you can do all of this by heading over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash starless. Again, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash starless. But for now, let's just get right into this interview with Steve Massey. Starless, the 1947 Pittsburgh Steelers. Let's start there. I have two, kind of like a two-part question. Why, first of all, use that headline starless? And then second... Why the heck write about a team from one year that kind of seems random and maybe not important to the grand scheme of the entire Pittsburgh Steelers organization? Well, uh, I chose the title Starless uh, because as I, as I did my research for the book, uh, they were referred to as the Starless Steelers more frequently as the year went on. And the irony was that the year before they had the uh, National Football League's MVP, uh, who had one of the greatest individual seasons that the NFL's ever seen. Um, so that's that's where I got the title. It was a contemporary from the newspaper headlines. Why did I pick it? Well, it's because I'm a lifelong Steelers fan. And uh, when I was growing up uh, in the 70s, I got really, I read anything I could get my hands on about the Steelers, wanting to know about them. And I came across this old book about the Steelers and it had the story of the 47 team. Uh, and it was one of the few teams that were successful in the Steelers history up until that point. And it was a great story. 
And then it ended tragically when the coach died, when the head coach died unexpectedly that spring. Uh, it's always stayed with me. I've always thought that was an interesting team. And I just decided to do some more research about it. And before I knew it, I had a book on my hands. Well, it's kind of how sometimes things fall in. Just, you know, you put the puzzle pieces together. But I have a puzzle now that you mentioned you're a lifelong Steelers fan. And maybe my ears are mistaken. I'm not picking it up right. But in my mind, in my ears, when I know we're not video, I can only hear a Southern twang. Are you from the Pittsburgh area or are you a Southern fan? How did you become a Steelers fan? No, no, I'm not. I'm not a Yenzer. Uh, I'm from <laughs> Mississippi. Uh, and yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm an old guy. I'm going to be 56 in a couple of weeks. And when I was a child growing up, uh, you pretty much, you got the football game that got broadcast. And so we had the saints on CBS and we had whoever on NBC. Well, they were looking for the, you know, the popular and successful teams. And voila, it was the Steelers and the Dolphins and the Raiders that was on the other channel. And so I became a Steelers fan and I never stopped being one. And as I got older, uh, even when they had terrible years, it just my interest just continued to stay with them. And I'm a fan to this day. OK, well, what about this upcoming season now that we're transitioning away from Roethlisberger? Are you... Uh, one of the guys that has, okay, new life and new hope, or are you one of the guys that, oh, man, here it is again? I I think right now I think it's a kind of a blank slate. Um, I To tell you the truth, I honestly didn't see how much decline there had been in the Steelers until this year, believe it or not. I guess love is blind, uh, but – that Kansas City game uh, that we had late in the year was, uh, was awful. It was an awful game. And there's just so much that's got to be done with that team, including a uh, an offensive line. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I can't – they're, they're my guys. It doesn't matter whether they win or lose, but I'm not exactly thinking they're going to be going to the Super Bowl this year. Let's put it like that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you're talking to a dude that's been a lifelong Lions fan, and I know that we don't have our videos working, but if I did, I'd be showing you, like, at arm's reach, all these different either Lions logos, or I'm looking at my Barry Sanders coaster, and when you mentioned, and we'll get into yeah. that story later of the, the uh, one of the greatest, you know, ru rushing seasons or whatever, the MVP on a losing team reminds me, reminiscent of Barry Sanders his entire career. I'm sure they had some success, but I think it was like one playoff game the entire, maybe since the seventies or six, it's been a very long time since they've had really any success in the Detroit organization. And speaking of that, so let's go backwards. You don't, I have a DeLorean that we're going to play with back and forth. We're going to hop kind of backwards, forwards and such, but let's get into before the 47 season leading up to the, what the book is all about. Like, why did it take 15 years before the Steelers had their first playoff berth, what was going on there? Well, they were they were kind of car star crossed, and they couldn't get a, a real identity or a star player. They kept getting them, and then they would disappear. They had John Blood McNally, who went to the Hall of Fame, and he was insane uh, in a in a good way and sometimes a bad way. Um, so he <laughs> wheeled in and out of there. And then they had Wizard White, and, and Wizard White played in the 30s. I think it was 1937, and Wizard had a great year. He was a big draw. A lot of fans came out to see him play, but he decided to pursue his academic studies, and he ends up being a Supreme Court justice. Uh, then they started making waves uh, in the early 40s, and then World War II hit. And when that happened, uh, I think the 40s, 42 or the 43 team got down to six players. The rest of them were in the war. Uh, so it was just one, you know, mishap after another, kind of a comedy of errors. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I just don't think they had an identity before the 46 team. And that was when Bill Dudley came along. Yeah. Speaking of Bill Dudley, that's the, uh, the MVP that we wanted to talk about, right? Yeah. Let's get right into that story. I mean, how 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 did that go? Because you mentioned something about was no longer like. Let's just get into the Bill Dudley story straight away. 
Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that you're a Lions fan because uh, you know Bill Dudley played for the Lions. He got traded to the Lions. Um, so that's kind of cool that that uh, that he was involved with that franchise. Bill Dudley was a, a little guy. He was about 5'10", about 180 pounds. The players were smaller back then, but he was small for even those days. He was at the University of West Virginia. Uh, he was a star there. And uh, the Steelers drafted him. And they signed him in 42, and he had a big year. Uh, the Steelers had a big year that year. The, the war happened, and Bill went off to the war. He comes back in 45 finishes out the year, and then in 1946, he has an incredible year. He leads the league in rushing, passing, interceptions, punts. I think he scores a, a couple of special teams, touchdowns. Um, he, he's just – he's off the chain, you know. Uh, but Jock Sutherland had been hired by the Steelers as the head coach. And they hated each other from the minute they laid eyes on each other in training camp. They couldn't get along at all. And so all of this was kept uh, out of the press and the media, of course, because it was all newspapers and radio then. Uh, and at the end of the year, they traded Bill to the Lions. And, you know, Pittsburgh was just in shock uh, that they'd gotten rid of this MVP. Uh, and so there were no star players left on the team when the 47 season started. Now, I was confused when I was trying to do a little research on this. It it appeared as though they traded him away. And if I'm not mistaken, it said something like the 1948 first round draft pick. But I see that Detroit and Pittsburgh both drafted in the first round of the 1948 draft. Unless I unless this is this pro football reference was wrong. No, uh, it, it's correct. What ends up happening is somewhere in there, there is a a Bears pick that gets exchanged. And through a long process, Bobby Lane ends up playing for both the Lions and the Steelers. And it's connected with these swapped picks. In the, in the immediate, what happened was that the Lions got Dudley which was a great deal for them. Uh, but the Steelers got uh, Paul White and Bob Siffers. And Siffers was one of the greatest punters of the 40s. So it ended up being a pretty good deal for both teams. Okay, yeah. And that was another thing that I was trying to figure out. I don't know enough of the history and the exchanging of players and everything. Because if you look at the draft itself, just like, on paper for pro football reference, it was Bobby Lane, which I'm like, wait a second that he, he got drafted by the bears. I'm like, I thought he was a lions player. <laughs> and then why a tittle got drafted by the lions. I'm like, wait, I thought he was Colts or something. And I was just very confused yeah. how everything went down. But I guess even back then they were slinging and wheeling just like they are nowadays. Oh yeah. And, and you know, if you really, if you really want to make it weird, uh, there's another football league called the AAFC, which ended up getting absorbed by the NFL, uh, but it was a kind of a forerunner of the AFL, and so you had multiple you had mute, multiple drafts going on. Uh, so, like the Browns were originally an AAFC team, um, and then they got swallowed up by the NFL when the AAFC collapsed. So, a lot of guys were drafted twice, like Eric Parsegian. The Steelers drafted him, but he went and played for the Bear, or the Browns. You know what? Maybe I wonder if that has something to do with because it's, it's strange as I'll get out. The second round and fourth round show that there were only two players picked. It was the Giants and the Lions both had a player. I wonder if that's just because they actually signed with the Giants and Lions versus the rest of the second rounders and fourth rounders signed somewhere else or. or I don't know. what it, It's just weird, I guess, the draft back then. Of course, it wasn't really like it was even that old. It was only a, a two or three years old at that time, I think. Uh, the draft? Yeah, I'm trying to think of what it is. I feel really bad. Sorry, Mr. Upton Bell, if you're listening to this. I know your father. And, uh, no, 36. Okay, not 46. <laughs> but yeah, I had a whole episode on the first draft. And I'm yeah. Like, I'm getting my wires crossed here. But yeah, no, it was 36, not 46. Okay. Well, 
Yeah. Well, it's easy. To, it's easy to do. It's a lot of guys. It's a lot of names. It's ninety years. You know, it's a hundred for the NFL. But when they started drafting, it kind of brought order to the NFL in a way. Um, although there was plenty of disorder along the way. You know, when the when the AFL and the NFL were in their were at war in the early '60s, there was a lot of stuff going on with those draft picks. It was really strange. Yeah, it's unlike anything that I really remember in my lifetime because even free agency ever since I can remember has always been there. I mean, sure, maybe my very, very early days of watching football, but we didn't know what that meant when I was six or seven years old. I mean, it was just a totally different world back in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Now you alluded to, okay, the next name that we got to talk about, the coach, Jack Sutherland, uh, you know, and let's just talk about leadership in general of the Steelers back then. And uh, let's go back. Why was he so successful or, you know, what was the story with Jack? Well, Jack, uh, to this day, is one of the most successful college coaches. He was at uh, University of Pittsburgh and he was at Duquesne. Uh, and he was the master of the single wing, which uh, back in those times, they just basically had one wide out uh, and the, anybody in the backfield could get the ball. There might be four guys and there'd be, you know, different fakes and uh, off tackle plays and things like that. And so he de- he developed this thing to a fine point and he was just highly successful. And he goes up to the NFL when the Brooklyn Dodgers hiring. So you want to talk about weird. There was a football team called the Brooklyn Dodgers and coach Sutherland was there and they ran the single wing, but he could, he didn't have the personnel to do it. Uh, so after the war, he, he goes off to world war two as well. Cause the NFL is drained of a lot of people, staff included. And when he comes back from the war, that's when Art Rooney contacts him now art rooney was was of course the owner of the steelers um he contacted him and he asked him he said are you still happy in brooklyn he said no and so that's when art rooney brought him uh to pittsburgh at the beginning of 1946 and they sold out all their season tickets um so that's that's how he got to pittsburgh he was a dentist he was a disciplinarian to a degree uh, the old my way or the highway cliche can wear pretty thin, but I think that was true in Jock's case. And he didn't say a lot. He wasn't a person that screamed at his players a lot, but he was he was pretty austere and he meant business and it was his team. So the uh, success was immediate in Pittsburgh uh, from 46 in 1946. They were uh, I think they were five, five and one. I had a 500 season. And then the, season that the book is about uh they had that breakout year and it looked like they were really going to go places yeah okay did was that just like a saying he was a dentist or was he a legitimately he was a dentist by trade oh oh no no he was actually a dentist i'm sorry that's i should have been a little clearer about that well that wasn't a nickname or a moniker or anything like that he was actually a dentist uh he graduated from dental school um, but I don't know that he did anything with it other than be a great football coach. I don't, I don't know whether he ha- ever had an actual practice or not because he died young, you know, for a coach, he died young because of his brain tumor that nobody knew anything about. Yeah. Unfortunately didn't have that chance to have that second or third career, but what, how did he, if he, if so, if he, he graduates as a dentist, how did he decide or how did that roll into a football career to become, like you said, one of the more successful college coaches back in the day. He played, he played for Duquesne and he was a, he was a really good ball player. Now I, you know, I hesitate to say, but I believe he played for pop Warner, like the pop Warner, um, the coach. So he would have been part of his coaching tree. And, uh, you know, he had enough success at it that he ended up, you know, like a lot of football players do when they become coaches, um, you know, he was just hired straight up the ladder. And it's really strange, too, because in the 40s, you know, college football was bigger than pro football then. Uh, it was much more important. So when he when he moved to pro football, you might say it was a step sideways or perhaps even a step down. Uh, but because of his success and guys like him, pro football 
became more elevated as time went on. So is that why, because he was a local, you know, Duquesne, Pittsburgh graduate, you know, ha- was a star there kind of thing. And that's why they sold out the season tickets. They were like excited for this coach. That's this homegrown guy. Yes. Yes. Because they, they were, those two programs were national caliber. Uh, they were elite programs like, uh, like Georgia today or Alabama or a program like that. Uh, highly successful. So they knew who he was. And the whole country knew who he was. And if you got, I, I'm not exactly sure of what his college record is, but in terms of winning percentage, um, it's it's got to be in the top ten. I would I would be absolutely floored if he's not in the top ten winning percentage. You know, I I'm I'm not positive, but I think he is. Um, and and it's not we're not talking about one or two seasons. He was there for several seasons in the college ranks. Yeah, that was going to be one of my next questions. It's uh, so it's not just uh, I was here for two seasons and I had a great run for two seasons, so my percentage is high. It's it was sustained success. It sounds like. Yes, sir. That's correct. Absolutely. So you kind of you you did allude to it. You said tumors in his brain, but they didn't find out till later. How, what do you mean by that? Was it just an autopsy that was covered up, or is just something that was brought out by the family later on? Well, no. When I when I say later. I mean, right before his death, because Jock went down every Easter. Jock went down into the South as a college coach to recruit players down there. Um, But, you know, because he was in the pros, he didn't have to recruit anymore, but he went down to see his friends. And he went down there to North Carolina and he was visiting with the coach of Duke, the football team, and he vanished. And he's gone for over a week and everybody's looking for him and they don't know where he's at. And they find him wandering around in this muddy field in Kentucky and his car stuck in the mud and he doesn't know who he is. And the, um, the police come, the sheriff comes and gets him and takes him back. And they finally figured out who he is. And they called the Steelers because they're not sure whether this guy's, you know, just, that he's nuts or what? And the, the Rooney's tell him, yeah, that's our coach. They they fly down there, they get him, and um, his assistant coach, Johnny Michelosin, drives his car back, and they get him home, diagnose him with a tumor, and he dies, like immediately, like within a couple of days. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I say that nobody knew about it, I mean he himself didn't even know about it until shortly before he died. Um, And it was it was a terrible shock. You know, it was a big banner headline in the front page of the uh, all the Pittsburgh papers. And, you know, uh, the pallbearers were all Steelers and uh, his college players were there. You know, it was just a really sad thing. And, And it was just another moment in Steelers history where it was just, you know, this kind of tragic event that happened that's, you know, spoiled this future success that the team thought they had. It was just another tragic event for the Steelers. You know, they were star-crossed. Yeah, I mean, again, that they had that, geez, so you're talking their first-ever playoff berth and first-ever winning season. Sure, they had some 500 seasons before, and and then this. Loss of life has no comparison to the chance of a team or a city, but they were rallying around him even now that I'm finding out that You know, he was kind of like this local hero from a college ranks, which is at that time still uh, number one compared to the the pros. So I can see where the city would really, you know, I don't. uh, Did they rally after that fact? I mean, is this something where the Steelers then went on a winning streak, or was it back to the ranks of the the low doldrums of the bottom? Well, that's kind of one of the things about Steelers history. Sometimes the things get overblown. The Steelers really weren't horrible uh, after Jock died, but they were, you know, they kind of stumbled along at 500 and then they'd have a few mediocre seasons. Um, Johnny Michelosin comes along after Jock and he was Jock's assistant coach and Michelosin runs the single wing and they're brutal. The Steelers are a brutal team. They beat people up, but he just, he couldn't, repeat what um, Jock had done. And by that time, the single wing was obsolete. Uh, So, you know, then they bring in Buddy Parker. And if you're a Lions fan, 
you know that Buddy Parker won two championships for the Lions. And um, he went to a third one. They lost to the Browns. There's no shame in that. Uh, but, you know, Buddy had those tough teams too. Uh, but he couldn't get them over the hump. And then when they hit the 60s, then that's when things really went down the toilet, to be frank about it. Uh, that was when they hit their lowest point. So it's 25 years before they even get to the playoffs again. 25 years after that 47 team. Yeah, that's basically one playoff appearance in a total of 40 years. So that's at the beginning yeah. of their franchise. Now we're talking about like my Lions and the <laughs> near the end of their franchise. At least we've been making yeah, it to yes. the playoffs, I guess, here and there. But uh, it's just not. Uh, we, we, we always go with the whole we have hope. We got to drink the Kool-Aid and we'll see what happens in the next years and the <laughs> year, years to come kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's just. When it gets you, when your team, when your team gets into your DNA, you know, you gotta, you gotta stick with them. It's what being a true fan is all about. <laughs> yeah. I think I've had that conversation on this show. I don't know how many times, but, uh, that's probably one of those things where the listeners going, this is all good. He's going to talk about this again. So let's, let's veer my DeLorean back towards this, this conversation of the 47 Steelers. And you gave me specific, okay. like actual names in the, the, the pre, the pregame, I guess we'll call it. Let's, the first one is who was Chuck? I'm going to pronounce this butcher it. Who was Chuck Ch- Cherindulo? Good, good job. That's that's him. Okay, well, Chuck uh, Cherindulo was the team captain. He was the center. He was uh, sort of the nose guard. They didn't run a four three defense back then, but he played uh, nose guard or middle linebacker, whichever you choose to call it. Um, he was a teacher. Uh, he had to be a great uh, snapper because you've got four different people that you could snap the ball back to in the single wing. One of the things that I learned in the single wing and learning about the single wing is that it is not a simple offense. That's not true. It's a very complicated offense. You only had one wide receiver, but not to get too far away from Chuck. Um, he went in the Navy in uh, World War II. And they, the guys that were in the Navy immediately recognized that he was a teacher. So he ended up training uh, NCOs. Um, and he was just a leader, a beloved figure. He goes on to a long coaching career. Um, he's, he pops up everywhere, a lot of winning teams. Uh, he's just an iconic guy. And he's also, uh, he's also Bill Dudley's best friend and roommate. Uh, Dudley trusted him a lot. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get into World War II a little bit, but before we do, there's another name you gave me, uh, Red Moore. Who was Red Moore, and what did he mean to the team? Yeah, uh, well, that I'm biased because I, I think that Red Moore is, uh, is this towering figure. He was a rookie. He had uh, played for Penn State, and Arnie, you'll have to check that, but I believe it is Penn State. And they were they were going to play a bowl game uh, against um, Miami down in Florida, and they had two black guys on the team. And Miami sent words up there word up there that you know they the black guys could not come play football down in Florida. And Red called a meeting of the players, and he said, "We're not coming to that bowl game unless our teammates come." So they end up not going down to the bowl. Uh, because the the team bonds together and they will not go and play as a team without their two teammates, without their two African-American teammates. So that doesn't get a lot of publicity until uh, Red Moore's death. And it's, it's actually in an obituary. And then the story came out at that time. And I've always wondered uh, the Steelers had in camp, they had two players from Miami. And I've always wondered whether, you know, the three of them discussed it or, or whether there was any mention made of it. I, I don't know. I've never found out. And he was and he was an all rookie, made the all rookie team, too. And I don't think Red played very long, um, but he made the all rookie team in the NFL. So he was an advocate back in the day when we're talking like the the forties and everything where the segregation, I guess when, when did, uh, Oh my gosh. What's the guy's name? Kenny, Kenny Washington. Was that the first in the NFL? Well, I, t- I actually have, I, I have a, a set, a few pages about the NFL. 
um, and the way that uh, black men were treated during this time period. There's an unofficial uh, color bar. There weren't there were black players from during the 40s and in the run up to when the Rams started integrating, which was around the, which is around the late 40s. Um, but there was this kind of this unofficial color bar. There were all the Steelers that played on the 47 team were white. They were all white players. And um, I think Jack Spinks is the first black Steeler after uh, the, the 34 team, the, the 33 team, the original Pirates, Pittsburgh Pirates football team had a black player on it. But I don't I, I can't recall his name. Uh, it's, it seems like it's Ray Matthews. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, they, there's there's not a lot of black players for a really long time. And, and for for what Red Moore did, it's it's the there's a dawning of civil rights after uh, the black soldiers come back from World War Two. Um, so, you know, Red Red is Red is a pioneer and it is kind of a. Uh, uh, it's well before Brown versus Board and all that stuff. I'm probably getting too uh, far off the subject, but um, I, I think it's in, I think it's an interesting time period. No, I am. That's that all plays a factor, and I don't think that it, it's it's interesting, and it's it's also one of those that's an important topic to continue to bring up because I had not heard the name Red Moore. I, I still, you know, until you sent me the 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 pre game whatever you want to call it the little notes and everything I didn't I didn't know that name at all so now that will be shared with not just myself but the listener of the show the the one listener that's listening to this t- this this podcast right now right and then you know from there they yeah. can they can spread the message I'm sure it's and, more than that all right so how about one of these other players that you sent me a name the name was Paul Adams what's the story with this gentleman well Paul Adams was a uh, very good center uh when he played college ball and he got drafted uh into service in world war ii and paul went into the pacific theater and he was one of the island hopping marines now the pacific theater was really rough there was a lot of heavy combat there it was personal flamethrowers and stuff and paul got shot uh and several times by the japanese and he got some uh, shrapnel near his brain stem uh, he came home and he played a season with the Steelers in 1947. And as far as I know, uh, Paul Adams is the only NFL player that ever played with shrapnel near his brain stem in the NFL. Um, he was a really remarkable man. And um, I, I'm hoping that if I ever rework the book that I have a bit more about him uh, than, um, than I have in the book. Um, because he was a, a just really a courageous person. He died in uh, the early 1970s. The uh, shrapnel worked its way to his brain and it killed him. Oh man, that yeah, I, I had not heard that one either. To have shrapnel in your brain to be able, and then that that impact violent collision sport, especially back then, it was more so yeah. i think that was near the time it was right around world war ii when they were making it, transitioning to making it mandatory for helmets because of the whole um they just the lack of having as many players available to them so i uh, just just one of yeah. those a hero that goes to yeah he's a total hero and he didn't talk about it when he came home from the war he didn't talk about it a lot um you know his son had to piece it together and his son steven uh i interviewed him about paul and um He's just a fascinating man. He really is. Yeah, so he played after uh, the war, and then we have Chuck, and we talk about this, and, you know, let's get into how the war changed and really altered the NFL, and more specifically for this episode, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, uh, you know, I, I always say that World War II, the end of World War II, was a diluvial event for the NFL. There was a, this washing away of it, – it, it's a demarcation line. If you look at the great Bears teams, those, mo- those wonderful monsters, the midway teams, you know, they were aging. And, you know, some of those guys got cheated out of their best years as athletes. So when the players come home from World War II, there's way more young players. There's more options for them. Um, there's a lot of money that's released into the American economy. Um, 
because when the the soldiers came home, they had all this back pay that had been stored away. And America was one of the places that didn't get touched by the war. So there wasn't a lot of rebuilding reparations to be made and all that. Uh, and so the ability to attend these football games, player salaries and so forth was greater at that time than there ever had been um, because, because of the war and the players coming home. Well, the Steelers had, I think the Steelers had 11 rookies on that squad. And uh, I think the, the roster size was around 35 guys. So the, the old Steelers that had been, you know, kind of this bumbling group of guys were washed away. And, you know, that's once the 46 team has some limited success, you know, they're able to build on that. And that was why the future was so bright for the Steelers when uh, Jock died, unfortunately. Well, something that came, I mean, during the middle of the war, we'll talk about the, we've, we've mentioned the Steagles on this, this podcast a few different times because we've had, well, I mean, I guess a couple, <laughs> specifically two episodes that had the interview. And then also I had a, an individual solo episode, but we've, we've brought it up numerous times. Uh, speaking of that, okay. So we have, you, you told me the fabulous Steelers Eagle rivalry, even though, you know, the Steagles, they were together for a little <laughs> bit. What, what comes to mind for you, like from the, of the rivalry from that era between the Steelers and the Eagles, like maybe a story or two. Well, the Steelers and the Eagles played three times that year. And, um, you know, they were, they were sister franchises. They both came along at the same time in the thirties. And so, you know, they became natural rivals because when they first started, you know, that was your chance there to be on equal footing with somebody. If you were playing the other guys from the, the other side of Pennsylvania, you weren't playing the Packers or the bears, you know, or the giants, you, you had an even chance of, of beating them. So they played twice every year because they were in the same division in 47 when they play one of the games, uh, the first game that they play, uh, the Steelers come back and they win the game. It's a very exciting game. It's exciting to read about when I was researching it. And uh, Meatball Meeks was this fellow. He was from Duke University, and he played for the Steelers. And he got tangled up with one of the Eagles on a play, and it ends up setting up a touchdown for the Eagles, a score for the Eagles. And um, this is like this great big controversial play because the Steelers all wanted pass interference. And, you know, uh, I mean, the Eagles wanted pass interference and the Steelers didn't, and he got called for it. And so it sets up this long uh, feud that goes all the way to the early 50s with the two teams at each other's throats. And it, it's really, it's ended in the early 50s by LB Nickel. He catches one of the greatest catches in Steelers history up until the immaculate reception uh, against the Eagles. And it, it spoils their season. Uh, and it's interesting. One, one thing that I will say that's kind of interesting to me is one of the guys from the Steagles that played with, uh, you know, he played on the Steagles. He knocked meatballs teeth out during that season. He knocked all of his front teeth out uh, during the 47 season in one of the three games. So, you know, I mean, he was, he was a rough guy, man. <laughs> it, was a, it was a tough era. I want to say his name was Frank Kilroy. I think that's, I think that's correct. Do you have any more stories for that, the rivalry, or was that kind of where you were leading into it and, and diving in the next? I, th I think that's a good lead in. I will, I will say this. I'll just jump in the DeLorean way ahead. Uh, in, in 69, there's the forgotten about OJ Bowl that was played between the Eagles and the Steelers uh, because OJ Simpson was going to be coming up in the draft. It may, it, it was in 68, I think. And um, the loser of the game would end up getting the rights to OJ Simpson and the Steelers <laughs> won the game. So the, the take in Pittsburgh was like, well, you know, we keep losing all these games and finally we come to a game that we need to lose and we win it. And it was a, it, Apparently, it was a horrible football game. I think the score was six to three. It was totally inept, but it was one of the last of the rival games. Yeah, I've seen that happen a few times where it was 
the Lions were supposed to get the first. I mean, last year, I guess, wasn't the way you could say, but a lot of people were like, hey, you should just tank to get the first pick. And I, I was always on the board, like, let's play. But then again, back then, having OJ would have been maybe a different type of story in that era. Um, we we got to go back to the yeah. Lions. I got a question for yeah, you. Yeah. Can I can I jump in and ask you a quick question? Were, were you rooting for Matt Stafford in the Super Bowl? One hundred percent. If it was feasibly possible to say one hundred percent was more than a hundred, I would say yes. I hundred. I I okay. wore my Stafford jersey during every Rams playoff game. Every game that I watched that wasn't against the Lions. Uh, granted, it was a Lions Stafford jersey, and I I just I couldn't be more proud or happy for him to go over to a team, get a chance. We as a Lions organization are not heading to the promised land in the near future and his prime years are there. I, I, if I could give a guy a hug, he'd be one of them in the NFL. Yeah. Well, we love him down here in Georgia. So I was rooting for him too. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. I mean, at, We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, the the AT and T commercial that he has said it right. Yeah. Like you could tell, he really does still care about the fans and the the organization, the team, the league. I'm sorry, the the state. But sometimes just it just makes more sense. It wasn't he did it amicably. It wasn't like a crybaby like some of these other quarterbacks that I've seen in the past. <clears throat> I won't mention Favre or anybody, but there's some other other type of stuff that's happened that <laughs> <laughs> we're going to lead into that. That's where we're going next. Let's just jump into it. So that's why I'm kind of saving yeah. this. This is the best one for last. You've already heard that I'm a Lions fan and I, I was going to bring this up and tell you, hey, from a personal <laughs> level as a Lions fan, you highlighted beating the Packers in Wisconsin. But you already kind of know that now. But let's get into that. The cheese heads, the graders, like you yeah. were the Steelers were the graders of the cheese back then. What why did you bring that up as such a, a momentous <laughs> occasion? Well, the the re, the reason was uh that I brought it up was totally contemporary. Um, because the Packers had owned the Steelers for a long, long period of time. Um they had they'd never beaten them. The the Steelers had never beat the Packers. And they had played in a preseason game and they beat the Packers in a preseason game. And uh, Walt Kiesling, who is this in and out of Steelers history, uh, happened to be coaching the Packers that year. He was the uh, I think he was the offensive line, defensive line coach. And he made some remarks in the papers that, you know, the Steelers would see the Packers down the road. And it's going to be a different story. Well, he went up there to Wisconsin and they beat him. And uh, it, it was another uh, confidence builder for that team uh, because it, it was something that the Steelers had never been able to achieve before, especially up there in Wisconsin when they beat them. Um, so in and, and the, the papers, the Milwaukee uh, papers were just overflowing with praise for the Steelers. They called them anonymous. Um, they said that this was an anonymous team and that they were the better team that day and that they were going to be there for a long time to have to deal with this, uh, these guys in the NFL. So uh, bringing up the Packers, that wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a thing where I was looking kind of backwards at it. It was just at the time, it was a big milestone for the team. Uh, so that that was just a big victory for them. I mean, that makes sense. Again, it's getting over another hump and a hurdle as a, at the time, even though it seems like, yeah, the Steelers have always been around, they were only there at that time for what, 15 seasons, I think it was, around about? Yeah, roughly. Yep. Yeah. Uh, about 13, 14, something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the teams like the Packers and the, the Bears, the Cardinals, I mean, they were teams that have been there for, for quite some time. And so it makes sense to, to kind of be, Hey, we finally were we're on the right track and all these types of deals. And you said it was a, a, a momentous moment, whatever whatever term you use for it. But that's what we want to do here. We get to play a little game, not that creepy little doll from the Saw movies, but we're going to play a game with a DeLorean. I'm going to hand the keys over <laughs> to you. You get to go back in time to any point. Great. In the 1947 Pittsburgh Steelers season, you get to relive that moment, but you get to be a part of the moment. What moment is that? Well, um. You know, I think that I'm probably on the field against the Redskins. 
And it's the first time that we play the Redskins, and they're big stuff, and they got Sammy Baugh, and he can throw and hit anything. And we're finding out that we can hang with them, we can beat them. It's a seesaw game, and we get all the way down to the last play of the game, and we got to kick a field goal to win it. Well, if I'm there, I'm going to catch that ball, and I'm going to place it on the ground perfectly. And the laces are going to be facing the other way. And Joe Glamp is going to kick that ball and it's going to go straight through the uprights and they're going to beat Washington. And there's not going to be a playoff game because we're going to go straight to the championship and we're going to play the Cardinals. There you go. That's as good as I can get in that (laughs) DeLorean. Wait a second. So not only are you participating in the moment, did you just alter the (laughs) outcome of the history when you come back to 2022? Well, I know what's going to happen, of course. You know, (laughs) look, all I got to do is catch the snap and put it down on the ground with the laces facing away. I can do that, all right? So we have. And then I get to to come home to my wife, right? Well, I don't know. In the movie, that didn't happen that way. It's an alternate timeline that you've just created. (laughs) And now you've got Biff Mansion or whatever it's called, Biff (laughs) Tower. So I hope that, hope you don't screw things up too much. Let's just put it that way. Right, right, right. So we win the game. We end up winning the game. And that's because if if Glamp would have hit that, if he would have made that field goal, if everything else would have been the same, the Steelers would have gone to the NFL championship. You know, they would have played the Cardinals. I don't know what would have happened after that because the Cardinals and Eagles were such great rivals. But you never know. They might have beaten them. They might have gotten a, a, a their first championship. Yeah. Things could have been differently. And uh I mean, I, I joke about changing the stuff, but let's get back more on a serious note here. Uh, when you wrote the book, I, I don't know the timeline of everything in considering all the players would have been extremely up there in age. Were you able to have any interviews with firsthand accounts of players or just from maybe, maybe family members even? Well, I tell you, there were, uh, I, I think there were two guys al- alive. Uh, one of them was uh, Gene Hubka, and Mr. Hubka died before I could speak to him. Um, and then there was uh, Paul Krieger, but I couldn't find him. And now he's interesting. He turned 100, and as far as I knew, as I as I know, when I wrote the book, he was still alive. Now, now, now Krieger went on to become an FBI agent. And, uh, you know, he what he did was he he uh, was part of the guys that nabbed Noriega and uh, he kept himself in shape all the way to the end of his life. But I couldn't find him. Uh, But all the other all the other players were gone. And I have little I have little obits about them, obituaries about them at the end of the book. Uh, There was only one man that I I could not find what happened to him. He he vanished. I couldn't find a thing in the world about him. Um, but after after he quit in the NFL, and, and part of it's because he had a common name. I think it, I think it was Bob Davis. Um, I never found out what happened to him. He just vanished. Uh, but the other guys, they all went on to live, you know, very interesting and successful lives. A lot of them got into coaching, and they were highly successful coaches. Now you. <laughs> Okay, this is not football. You said nabbed. I'm I'm googling furiously trying to figure out great nabbed in Noriega. I feel like I've heard that before. What what is that like a drug cartel or something? Oh, oh, I'm 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, he was a, a, a dictator down in Panama that was uh, running drugs, and um, he got into a, a big standoff with the United States during the uh, late Reagan, early Bush one years, and um, we actually. Uh, went down there and invaded the, the United States invaded Panama uh, to capture him. And they brought him back to Florida. I don't know whether he's still alive or not, but he's, if he's still alive, he's in the federal penitentiary. Um, but Krieger was involved in that. His, his FBI career was much more notable than his Steelers career. But um, the, God love him. If he's still alive and he could be, he's 102 now. People do live that long. Uh, but I, I could never find him. I couldn't find a way to get in touch with him. And if he had, if he had passed away, I couldn't find any evidence of that either. Huh? Yeah. That, 
That is, I didn't realize that that was a story here. I mean, that leads me perfectly into what I was going to talk to you a little bit about just briefly. You have, it looks like numerous other books, uh, war books. Did you have some politics books too? When I clicked on Amazon, your name, it, it popped up like five books. So it was on there. Well, I've got, I, I, I wrote it. I have a short book about the civil war and I have a shorter book about, um, um, one of the battles, one of the small battles in the Civil War, uh, because I have some relatives that were in one of the Mississippi regiments. Um, and so when I found out about those guys, I wrote a short history of the regiment. And then I did a couple of other pamphlets. Uh, one of them was about Syria. And uh, the other was just a, a, a collection of Marco Rubio's speeches, his foreign policy speeches in front of Congress. It was just an edited book that I put together about his speeches. Okay, that that's what I was I was finding up when I was digging. Even on like Goodreads dot com, I found it, like under your name, it clicked all these other ones, and I, which made me beg beg the question of you. Most of your books were not sports related. Of why did you, why did you? How <laughs> we started the conversation out this way, but how did you fall in? Like, okay, I'm going to write a book about the forty seven Steelers. Well, I got to tell you uh, that the Steelers book flew out of my fingers. I wrote it so fast. I, I mean, it just, it just came pouring out of me. And I, you know, I guess it was because it's something fun. It was about something fun, something that brings us together, entertainment. Um, and that, that's why I enjoyed writing that book so much. Um, I have one regret and one regret only about the book. And that's that I didn't put footnotes or end notes in there. Um, and the reason that I didn't was I didn't want it to be a big stuffy kind of book with a lot of references and all that stuff. And I wish that I would have now, I wish I would have put a bibliography in it um, because I, I, I did so much research on it. I had to, I had to leave a lot of stuff out um, and I'm, I'm writing another one right now and I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's, it's a whopper of a book. It's going to be really big, big in terms of pages, not necessarily in terms of hype or whatever. <laughs> well, that was going to be naturally my next question, or is that something that's not to be revealed yet publicly? No, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to reveal it because I'm excited about it. Uh, I'm writing a book uh, about the uh, rise of the Steelers dynasty. Uh, it's going to stop at Super Bowl Nine, the first Super Bowl, but I'm going to talk about how that team was built piece by piece. But what I'm going to put into the book is I'm going to talk about who were the guys that found these players, who were the scouts, who were the people that got them, you know, uh, and a lot of people think that uh, the only important scout that was with the Steelers was Bill Nunn, and he's extremely important, but there are a lot of other people that came along to put that team together. Um, and when Coach Noel comes along, he's going to bring in some assistance that have never gotten uh, the credit that they deserve for turning that team into uh, what it became. Um, and I'm going to talk about how the players developed, how the coaches developed them. And I'm, I'm really going to try to put this thing in terms of understanding uh, the role of a coach and a player together in the NFL of the 60s and 70s. Well, that should be, I mean, right up the alley of the listener of the show. So whenever you get that, uh, when it, we get a published release date and everything, we'll have to bring it back on. And hey, now I'm going to have to publicly uh, put some pressure on you. Sounds like you need to start your own podcast in the Sports History Network about the Steelers back in the day. Love to. Love to. I'd, li I'd like to get uh, other guys that write on with it, too. It wouldn't just have to be the Steelers. I could go for any sport. I'd love to. Sounds great. We'll talk about that, you know, when we're not really recording and editing and all that stuff. But where can the listener sure. of the show find you or find your work if they're interested to get in touch with you? Well, uh, it, you can you can find me on Twitter. Just uh, go to the search and uh, type in Starless Steelers and you'll see me with a smirk on my face uh, in the profile picture. Um, you can also find me on Facebook under Starless Steelers. You can get my book on Amazon. Um, and I think you can get it on at some other places too, like Barnes and Noble. I'll tell you what, if the listeners want to get a copy of the book from listening to your podcast, I'm not going to tell anybody else. They have to listen to the podcast. If they'll send $12 to my cash app, R-E-D-S-T-3, 
I'll send them a copy of the book. That includes posting and handling and everything for only 12 bucks. It's normally $14.99 plus postage. So there's a little gem hidden in the what we're talking about. So I oh, appreciate it. I mean, I'm sure the listener of the show appreciates it too. And hopefully yep. by the time this is done, we will, it'll, it'll release on Wednesday. We're actually short, short notice, uh, recording and pro- production process on this episode compared to some of my other ones. So we'll get this one out on Wednesday. And with that being yeah. said, any last words of great iron knowledge nuggets for the listener of the show? Um, no, I just think, um, we're really, you know, as a country, we're really divided now. And I think that we need to find things that bring us together. And sports and entertainment are one of them, and I hope we can hold on to that. Um, so, you know, engage, have a team, watch, watch it with your family. Just try to let the, the troubles of the world off your shoulder if you can. Uh, that's what I try to do, and that's why I love this team, and I love writing the book. There you go. Let's all come together. And not be divided. And we can use sports to just let the troubles of the world roll off of our shoulders, just like Steve Massey does. And speaking of Steve, if you want to get a copy of his book, he's graciously given our listeners of the show. He, he said, hey, just send me $12 to my cash app and put the code REDST3 and get your grubby little hands in this discounted book, which normally will cost $14.99 plus shipping and handling. And speaking of that, again, this is a good time to remind you that Steve's also graciously offered to be able to give us an autographed copy of his book to one lucky winner. You can sign up to this by heading over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash starless. And if you do like this interview, again, there's other podcasts on the network that have interviewed Steve for their shows. One of them, for instance, is Football's Family. And we have Pigskin Dispatch, both of which are going to be over on the show notes page on the sportshistorynetwork.com website, which is, you guessed it, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash starless. And while you're at it, don't forget to mash that little follow or subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes every time they release. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.